Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jens Chapman. I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Seattle Science Foundation in Seattle, Washington, the United States of America. I'm a practicing surgeon at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Hangman's fracture and explore if this is an ongoing treatment dilemma. I have no pertinent conflicts of interest to disclose, but I am an editor uh, of a larger journal, the Global Spine Journal. The big question is, what's the actual problem of Hangman's fractures? Is there an ideal classification? There are about seven or eight out there. And is non-surgical care actually effective? And how appropriate and how successful are surgical cares? And if there's one way better than the other? And what are the outcomes? So first, let's go into the name. <clears throat> of all of our spine fractures, the term Hangman's fractures is clearly one of the most dramatic and traumatic looking. And there's a lot in that name. <clears throat> There's a lot in that name. It's actually a misnomer. Hangman, the act of hanging a person, is one thing. Hanged man is the fracture itself. It's what the poor victim of the hangman's craft sustains. So hangman's fracture is not really clear. As I look to the literature, uh, there's a very clear difference with how the hanging was actually performed. And this is relevant for the types of fractures. The submental knot created later in the era of hanging is one where the, basically the chin gets hyperextended backwards, the C2 ring gets overloaded, the fracture occurs as a hyperextension trauma. And this is very important because the classic mechanism of hangman's fracture is some form of axial load with either hyperflexion or extension or rotation. So both lead to very significantly different fracture patterns and have inferences in terms of discoligamentous instability. So the submental knot with the hyperextension trauma is different from the subaural knot, which was the historical thing. So the hyperextension overload will basically lead to hyperextension kind of an injury, more B-type or C-type injury versus hyperflexion overload, where there's some degree of forward bending movement. In a general overview, uh, hangman's fractures encompass about 15 to 20% of all C-spine fractures. They're predominantly something that affects younger patients and usually as a result of motor vehicle trauma or falls. Uh, obviously, plain x-rays still have a significant role because we do want to have alignment and stability assessed. A CAT scan and MRI scan are commonly obtained. The MRI scan helps us obviously with cord injuries, but also assessment of discoligamentous injuries. And when there is any question of a vertebral artery injury, meaning the transverse foramen is involved in the fracture and displaced more than one millimeter, we do want to have a low threshold for a CT angiography. Now, this is the classic article, and uh, this was named uh, after the first author, Dr. Schneider, in 1965, and his suggestion was to call it a hangman's fracture, which, as I explored earlier, is probably a misnomer. My first and foremost recommendation is and remains the F and D classification, which had basically three different types, a simple bony injury from axial load, and then either extension or flexion injury type in type twos, and type threes with a dislocation plus hangman's fracture. The pars interarticularis is broken, the traumatic spondylolisthesis, which would be the far better, far more precise term. So again, this differentiation of relatively stable benign injuries and unstable injuries with a pernicious discoligamentous injury is the key of the whole thing. And again, this is where we want to try to put our analytical lenses on and see if we can understand how this fracture happened because yes, the discoligamentous injury is the key to the successful treatment and understanding of this injury. There is confusion because there are atypical fractures where they're kind of obliquely going through or involving the axis. These are all play themes of the same general theme. There was an axial overload of C2, the ring broke, and either there was a flexion extension and or a rotation maneuver taking place. Now let me remind you that AO, as a global effort, has really tried to make sense of things, and we do have a nice upper cervical spine classification system. And I'm going to pitch that to you because I think that this will simplify things and help us all. For the C2-3 motion segment, which is relevant for the hangman's fracture, there's a key differentiation. Type 2 or type 3 injuries. Type 2s are mainly bony injuries. Type 3 are ligamentous injuries. Just this very important point of how much ligament disruption is there helps us understand and helps us guide treatment. So the displacement is also something that is very helpful to understand in plain x-rays. And this is the classic paper by Francis and Fielding. And they basically looked at measurements in terms of translation and angulation. 
If we put both of those together, more than 11 degrees of angulation, more than 3.5 millimeters of translation, we have a very helpful set of plain radiographic parameters that we can really use. Treatment options we all know. The main ones still remain a rigid collar for the more innocuous injuries, a halo or a Minerva brace for more displaced injuries that are more bony, that we want to realign a bit. And again, we want to remember that bony injuries have a good healing track record. And finally, we can either do an anterior cervical fusion C23 with good technique with bicortical screws or a posterior C1, C3 fusion. All other things, even combined anterior posterior surgery should be an exception and not the rule. Here, I do want to point out Dr. Goel's key discovery of C1 fixation. Dr. Harms gets a lot of credit for this, but Dr. Goel first published it, and this is a safe and game-changing way to fix C1 onto C3 and to treat Hangman's fractures under sacrifice of the atlantoaxial uh, articulation. Prior to that key thing, uh, the posterior treatment for Hangman's fractures was a craniocervical fusion, which is far more disabling. So kudos to Dr. Goel. One thing that we still want to identify is the worst case scenario of a discoligamentous hangman's type or traumatic spondylolisthesis injury. That's a dislocation of C23 plus a traumatic spondylolisthesis. These are very pernicious injuries. This patient required a CT myelogram due to a pacemaker, and we had an urgent decompression infusion with screws that crossed the fracture. He healed well and recovered well. Talking about interfragmentary compression screws, those are the so-called Judea screws. This is something that's became, become very popular, but again, my worry is that if you have a truly unstable injury, this is not satisfactory. And if you can easily put that screw in, probably it's an easy fracture, could have been probably treated with a collar and upright x-rays to make sure the fracture stays in place. But I grant it, this is something exciting for a lot of surgeons, and it shows surgical prowess, but again, we want to be really judicious in when we use it and how we use it. Now a quick sidetrack on halos. They've been really kind of bad-mouthed very badly in the past. And again, in some climates like tropical zones, it might just be not suitable. At Harborview, we actually, in my time there, did one of the largest series ever, almost 300 patients with seven years follow-up. And we actually found something very different from others. We found that indeed a quarter of patients could not be cleated, treated to completion of injuries. We also had a large number of hangman's fractures in there. That's the middle blue post in the middle. So that's a very important thing. We found a wide spread of injuries, but one very important thing that we looked at, when we looked at survivorship analysis in terms of when do halos fail, we found that the main failure actually happened after two weeks. So if you want to do a non-operative treatment for whatever reasons, and you do need some reduction, a halo can work. Get upright x-rays, get lateral x-rays laying down. If the alignment looks good, try it, and you will know with a high likelihood by two or three weeks if there's a failure. And at three months, most patients actually then heal. Now, results review in my final five minutes. There are four general studies I want to look at, one general prospective overview, one direct repair, a comparison anterior-posterior, and a systematic review. The prospective overview comes from France. It's a more recent paper. They had 55 patients, and basically they had a plethora of uh, treatment options that you see listed. All fractures healed. Nine patients had multiplanar reductions and lag screw fixation in an Indian study, which was very nicely done. They did do this Jude skew in these patients, and these were all very carefully selected patients. The x-rays shown are very clean, but most of them did have a fusion C23 done. So uh, reductions were performed likely very early within 48 hours, and a trans-fracture lag or compression screw was placed at C2 successfully in these nine patients. I view this as a case series. Again, the fractures seem very well treated in this, uh, this series, but I'm not sure what the true larger scale scientific merit is. It's more proof of concept. A Chinese study compared anterior and posterior uh, surgeries in a non-randomized fashion, 45 patients, nine-year period. All literally were young patients with car crashes and fall from height. This is an unreadable demographic slide, but just shows that the two groups were pretty comparable. What are the insights? They literally had no changes in alignment, no major differences in complications between anterior and posterior in all aspects, including outcomes and radiographic parameters. Very few failures, 
in both ante and posterior. Note on the posterior fixation that the rod in this image is a little bit long and hitting the occiput. Note that on the right side, the screws placed at C23 are probably not truly bicortical. You have to be still very careful what patients to select and you want to avoid osteoporotic patients. I'll conclude with a systematic review, and here's a conflict of interest potential because I'm one of the editors-in-chief of Global Spine Journal. This is published in our journal, a systematic review, and this is pretty much the established world literature on, uh, on hangman's fractures, on traumatic spondylolisthesis, and you'll see that all of these are pretty much case series, just what I've shown you. What are the main insights, surgery versus non-surgery? In general, the authors concluded that most of these patients can be treated very well with whatever the surgeons have chosen, and they have very good outcomes. There are no differences that they could identify in the very rare patients with anterior posterior surgeries versus posterior or anterior only. Here's an illustrative case with which I'll intend to close. This is a 19-year-old male with a bad motorcycle crash, and he took a long time to be extricated. Uh, he didn't move anything. There was a question of an anoxic brain injury. Uh, we did identify a type 3 injury with a dislocated C23 joint. He did have the typical relatively non-displaced PARS fractures. Here are the uh, exemplified. I would call this a type 3 in the FND Levine classification or an AO type C23 type 3 injury with spinal cord injury. I prefer the latter now because I think it just simplifies everything into bony or ligamentous. With 10 pounds of traction, we got some improvement. We saw a bad spinal cord injury. We did take the patient for closed reduction and then to the OR. And 24 to 48 hours after injury, he started blinking his eyes. He started moving. We did a C1 to C3 fixation with Goel harm screws. We did a cable grafting. You can see the images afterwards here. And a very nice reduction was achieved. And the patient actually had a very favorable neurologic outcome. So we're very happy with that. So <clears throat> conclusions. Uh, the FND Levine system, or preferably the new AO system, are my classifications of choice. Forget all the others, they're great, well intended, and all that, but this is what helps the historical one or the very simplified new AO system, which we really hope will be global. Key insights, uh, I think, are still relevant. You have to understand the biomechanics of the injury and you have to differentiate is it an osseous or an uh, osseoligamentous injury. And generally, good treatment results are a result of a careful analysis as reported in the literature. Uh, my preference for a stable injury is to put the patient in a rigid neck collar. And as I said several times, get a lateral x-ray recumbent, get a lateral x-ray upright to see how the patient holds up. And if it stays in an acceptable position and the patient's doing fine without undue pain, let them go. For unstable injuries, my first go-to option is an anterior cervical C23 fixation with bicortical screws under avoidance of kyphosis and over distraction. My second go-to option is a posterior decompression fusion C1 to C3. With this, I conclude and I thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to our discussions.